Greetings, Black Light once again. I want you to follow this uh, series of videos that I'm putting together. A message to my young black gangsters, wannabes. And I'm talking about the brown, the red, and the yellow brothers. I consider y'all part of the black nation. But I'm going to let this one roll before I comment. I'm not going to go too deep into my comment comments on, on the beginning. But we're going to let this roll. So I'll come in back later with my comments. But pay attention real good. This is what's happening now. Same year. You went the advent of Prohibition of liquor from Canada to, to Chicago. I mean, you, you began now, you get Al Capone and our lucky Luciano, and these guys are organized to run that liquor. The mob went on to become the most violent and ruthless criminal organization in Chicago and beyond. In 1929, law enforcement began a full assault on Capone, his men, and his operation. By 1933, prohibition was overturned and Capone was in jail. Chicago street gangs during the mid-1930s grew stronger as many members returned from their stint in the mob. Street gangs were also growing throughout the country. On the West Coast, new immigrants would set the stage for more street gang violence. During the early 1920s, post-World War I prosperity had given new opportunities to the less fortunate. In addition, laws that restricted European immigration helped to ease the burden in many of America's overcrowded slums. These factors eliminated many of the conditions associated with street gangs. But immigration from Mexico was less restricted. Mexican citizens poured over the California border to fill low-paying agricultural jobs. During the late 1920s, more than two million legally arrived in the Los Angeles area. They were not met warmly. Mexican people were seen just like a bunch of rags, you know, just toiling for meager allowances, you know. The discrimination against the Mexican was always underground. They tried to tell the world that we welcomed the Mexican people to come and help the United States. But deep inside, they had their own name for us. Greasers, you know, and many other words that offended our people. Slowly, the majority of Mexicans in America established themselves as laborers and domestic workers. In the period between the two world wars, many Mexican immigrants had successfully assimilated into American society. But not all were able to adapt. Over time, some of those alienated Mexican Americans named themselves Pachucos. The newly adopted label described the conflict many were feeling. Pachucos is a word that came into vogue back in the late 1930s, 1940s, and it was used to explain those who were like the marginals, right? Who were losing their Spanish-speaking and Mexican acting ability and not quite making in terms of the English-speaking and Anglo acting ability. They were like lost in between, marginal. Faced with prejudice on the streets and discrimination in the workplace, many Pachuco teenagers in Los Angeles rebelled against society. Some dropped out of school, others refused to join the military, and many banded together on the street. It's not the first generation, it's the second generation. It's the kids that are Americanized and not feeling like they've been accommodated in terms of being Americanized because there was a lot of racism, a lot of cultural repression, and a lot of other ways Mexicans were taught and learned that they were second-class citizens. 
The discrimination motivated many Pachucos to join together in a distinctive street look, a look that refused to blend in. They adopted a kind of uniform, a flashy style of dress that came to be called the Zoot Suit. The Zoot Suit itself was a badge of rebellion. Only adolescents wear Zoot Suits, or sometimes hustlers and jazz musicians and people who are really on the edges of acceptable society. And so the use of the Zoot Suit by adolescents was a way of declaring adolescent were against grown-up society. When I wore my Zoot Suit, I felt a tremendous high. I thought I was king of the world. I had my hat, I had my tie, I had my shirt, my coat, my overcoat, my double sole shoes. That was really something. Borrowed from the jazz culture of the 1930s, the term zoot suit simply meant something worn in extravagant style. The dramatically padded shoulders and tapered pants were usually topped with a fedora or pancake-type hat. The Chuko boys felt zoot suits brought them respect and also helped to attract the attention of Mexican-American girls. But in Los Angeles, the zoot suitors had competition. The servicemen in Los Angeles on their way to war would frequently go to clubs, nightclubs, jazz clubs, where they would pick up Mexican-American women. And there was a very natural rivalry between the servicemen trying to pick up Mexican-American women and Mexican-American male adolescents who didn't particularly care for the fact. Many in the military resented zoot suitors because their dress placed them in direct defiance of the War Board's Rationing Act, a law that forbade the use of excess garment material. Ethnic tension also existed because these Mexican-American kids with their zoot suits were obviously not going off to war, and the mostly white servicemen were. So there was a, a good deal of, of, of tension. Uh, between the two groups that then exploded in the Zoot Suit riots. It happened on the evening of June 3rd, 1943, when a group of 11 sailors clashed with a gang of 20 Zoot Suiters on a downtown L.A. street. The Zoot Suiters got the best of the sailors. But after the fight, word of the melee spread quickly to the nearby naval armory. According to the sailors, when they went back to the armory, they'd said these... Pachuco said zoot suiters jumped them. So the sailors went on their own to go around looking for zoot suiters and beating them up. For the remainder of the evening, fights between the sailors and zoot suiters broke out around the city. Press accounts the next day favored the sailors. So did the police department. They would go around and arrest the Mexicans and put them in jail for disturbing the peace. They were the ones that were blamed for the problem. In other words, in the newspaper headlines were saying, let the servicemen clean up the city of all these gangsters and all these pachucos. A lot of racism tied in with that. Yeah, we're going to come back with another hit of this. See, the bigger picture is the Caucasian is trying to control the masses. We're talking about the upper echelon of the Caucasian. You know, he wants to be in control of everything. And he's at war against the dark, brown, uh, dark people, the brown man, the red man, the yellow man, and the black man. And we killing off each other, see. But anyway, this is Black Light. Stay tuned for the next one.